Hi everyone, and uh, welcome to the second HPC application session. We have two great talks coming up in the session. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Nikiwe Mlanga. She is from Mintech in the Advanced Materials Division, which is home of the DSI Mintech Nanotechnology Innovation Center. She received a PhD at the University of Johannesburg, where she is a recipient of the UJ CSR anniversary. And while she was doing a PhD, she worked within the CSR National Center for Nanostructured Materials. Um, currently, uh, Dr. Mlanga's research is focused on surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy probes for the detection and quantification of infectious disease such as malaria. So, Dr. Mlanga, I'm going to hand over to you to give us more info on your, on your talk. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna, for the introduction. I hope my slides are showing and everything is in order. Yes, your slides are showing. Right. Oh, okay, thank you so much. So as I've been introduced, I am Nigi Wemsanga from the Mintech, which is based on Redback by 200 Malibongo Drive. So today I just want to give a brief introduction on on my cluster, on the HPC related activities that are done at my cluster, which is at AMP, but with a special focus on the surface enhanced or mass spectroscopy projects, which, which are the biosensors for infectious diseases such as malaria. So first, I'm just going to give an introduction of, of the institution, the research and the different research groups. <laughs> so Mintech is basically a research and development institution which focuses on mineral processing and metallurgical engineering products and services to industries worldwide. So the research and development is mostly, um, load is mostly carried by three technical clusters, which are the mineral processing and characterization cluster, which is subdivided into mineralogy, analytical chemistry, and mineral processing. Secondly, we have the extraction metallurgy cluster, which houses the metallurgy groups, that is your bio, hydro, and your pyrometallurgy. And then, but not the least, we have the mining <coughs> materials and automation cluster, which houses the measurement and control, advanced materials, mining and mineral economics. And I am from the advanced materials. So the advanced materials can also be um, uh, abbreviated as AMD. It is mandated to serve the national interest through research, development and technology transfer, which promotes mineral technology and foster the establishment and expansion of industries in the field of minerals and products derived therefrom. So the this, 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 this slide here just summarizes AMD as a whole. It has, it is divided into four uh, research groups, which is the catalysis, physical metallurgy, the health platform, and the nanotechnology. So the HPC activities started with the catalysis group, which were mainly, fo mainly focusing on their highest projects in the development of fuel cells. It later then expanded into the physical metallurgy and the health platform group. So what happens is that um, the physical metallurgy group, they are mainly using the, the, the platform for their novel, for the, in the calculations for properties of their novel, novel memory shaped alloys. And then the diagnostic group where I come from, we use the platform in, the, in, 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 in calculating properties which enable us in the synthesis of our diagnostics which are in the form of surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy and also lateral flows. So in a nutshell, nutshell that is the dynamic um, and multidisciplinary AMD division. So going forward, then I will just go straight into the SES project, which is the gist of the talk today. So in SES, which is the surface enhanced phenomenon has been around in the last five decades. It's basically entails to the amplification of what would have been a traditional lower Raman signal in the presence of, of your roughened metallic surfaces, such as your gold, your silver, and your copper nanoparticles. So one thing unique about those, those three metallic nanoparticles I've mentioned is that they, all, they are all characterized by a localized surface plasmon resonance 
which is what actually brings about the whole amplification or the enhancement of what could have been a low traditional Roman signal. So I have a figure here, figure one, which somehow shows a traditional sketch or what we've adopted in our in, in, in our research group as our as our probe, as our assessed probe. So I would just like uh, give her a, like uh, explain a bit on actually what is happening in in the, in this sketch. So traditionally, you will have your support, which is could be in a form of glass or silicon wafer, and then from that we chemically mobilize our cell surfaces, which are the metal nanoparticles, and then on that we then attach chemically attach a, 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 a capture antibody. So if you're working, let's say, with malaria, then you are going to attach a, a malaria antibody, which will be able to identify and, and detect a, a malaria antigen in this case, which is represented by the structure. And then in addition to that, then we need a detection system. And this detection system varies depending on the Raman properties of our antigen. So in a case whereby the, whatever you analyze that you are trying to capture is Raman active, then your detection system will have a detection antibody, which also identifies the antigen and binds it at a specific epitope. And then this also is conjugated to one of the plasmonic nano, nanomaterials. But in a case whereby this is Raman active, like it could, it does have Raman fingerprints, then we subtract the Raman reporter or the Seth tag. However, most biological molecules are not Raman active. So in that case, then we need to attach a Raman reporter or a cell tag. Everything here is chemically bound. So somehow by detecting the fingerprints or the characteristic peaks of this cell tag, we are able to confirm indirectly the presence of the antigen. So in a nutshell, that's just the, the traditional uh, structure of, of the, of the cell biosensor. The reason that we decided to go with this up with this approach, in addition to other approaches that we have inside for diagnostic of these infectious diseases, was the various uh, advantages that it offers, such as high sensitivity, the fact that we can both quantify and 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 it's it's a both qualitative and a quantitative method of detection, and it could be it has a capability to actually be a multiplexing and it is a single molecular fingerprint. So in the next few slides, I'm just going to highlight how we have actually used the, the HPC platform to enable the fabrication of, 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 of one of our cells probe. So as I've mentioned that we're using metallic nanoparticles. So in a case where we're using them, like the, 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 the ones that we're using in-house are citrate kept. And for us to be able to synthesize the appropriate sizes, and be aware somehow of the ratios of, of, of our of our precursors when we of the starting materials. There is the gold, the, the gold or the silver salt and the capping capping agent agent, which is sodium citrate. We somehow use the, the simulation to sort of guide that whole process. For example, here in figure two, we actually were able to study the interaction of the of the of the capping agent, which is the citrate with with the with the with the, with the silver nanoparticles particle, which was decorated with different um, uh, 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 which which had different planes. So what we can deduce from this is that the the the, the capping agent like is attracted to one particular plane on the on the, on the silver nanoparticles. So it doesn't matter how much you can add; they sort of all sort of clump in one area, which is the area of interest. So this talks into the size because what happens is, is adding more of the of the citrate it actually increases the size of the nanoparticles. So with this, we're able to deduce the, the right experimental details for us to use in the laboratory. Then going on, we also, since I've mentioned that our detection system is a, an indirect method, so we are capping it, we are adding actually a SS tag, and the SS tag that we use for the study is for mecatobenzoic acid. So the platform also enables us to actually study the interaction of the SS tag with the with the with the nanoparticles, the the the, the four MPA that we use has a thiol end and, a, and an acid end. So what normally re literature will report is that it has a high affinity for the thiol binding. So it depro deprotonates and then bind with the sulfur. But we wanted to go like a bit deeper to understand if the interaction is the same. If for say, let's say it's a, for a gold and a, a, a silver nanoparticle, do they bind the same way? And we studied that um, and at, 
with different planes even of the of our metallic nanoparticles and we deduced a whole lot of information from that which we were able to publish going forward since our system is going to be used like at the end of the day we introduce biological molecules we are also able to download um antibodies from the from the protein bank and also use the platform to actually study how it actually interacts with the with the system and we able like in this case because there were no any chemical uh, uh, attachment it was just a physics option at this point so what did we do with all of this information which we were able to to, to teach us so this information it all enabled the whole experimental approach for us to be able to actually go to the lab and synthesize this, this probe. And in this case, I'm going to I'm, I'm showing results of the probe that we're able to synthesize, which was a malaria. This probe was then used, um, tested on specimens, non-infectious malaria specimens from different regions, which were from Nigeria, Santa Lucia, and the Philippines. And what's interesting is that these samples, they had different um, loadings of, of the parasite in them. So what is interesting is that our detector, which is our probe, was able to actually quantify that. They were able to, to, to detect that, like this is a lower, like if you see the, the, the sort of a cropped uh, uh, spectrum over here, it was able to, 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 to sort of quantify the different uh, parasitic loadings of, of, from the specimen. And then we also went on to study the rapidity of, of our testing system. And we were able to even capture, like um, to, to have like Raman picks of the four MBI even at three minutes. Of course, with the ex ex expansion of the of the incubation time, then we're able to even have more pronounced uh, peaks. Going forward, on the when when the COVID uh, uh, when COVID started, which is like late twenty nineteen and twenty twenty, we also decided to somehow try and play in the in to to come up with a detection in for, for COVID. We had one team which was working on lateral flows. And then I worked on to try to, to try and adopt the, the existing SES platform for, for COVID testing. So what we did, we were trying to use the ACE2 as our detection system. So like we substitute this antibody here with the ACE2. So for us to know exactly what ACE2 to use, we downloaded a, 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 a PD, PDP file from the protein bank, which through the platform we're able to analyze the active, the, the most active sites, and then we're able to come up with a sequence of amino acids, which we're going to use as our ACE2, like a part of the ACE2, not the whole structure. And this we're able to synthesize in the lab. And then with us, it was on this part of the detection system. We already had a spike, which were it says as our analyte. And then we had one COVID antibody. So the system was like that. However, after testing the system on the spot, that it had had very poor sensitivity, which somehow was, uh, was a bit disappointing for us. But we hope to revisit this and sort of come up with ways of improving the sensitivity going forward. So in a nutshell, that's just what we've used mostly the platform for at, um, at, 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 at AMD. Um, diagnostic so like in the next few slides i just want to cover like the like probably the importance of why we need the computation resources and then the challenges and the successes that we've had thus far so as i've mentioned before like we run really large systems which we cannot be able to hang in our own local computers so we really need the platform and also we need access to the various codes that we need especially the 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 biological and the chemistry codes which we use, the DFT codes. And then all of this works actually into facilitating or enhancing our, our experimental procedures. And all of that can actually be, like actually helps to come up with prototypes as we have registered one of our prototypes on, on, the, on the malaria test crop. So in the, our success, I think is mostly on, we have students in the pipeline who are working towards getting their, 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 their various degrees. And we also been able to publish and we have one prototype and we're hoping for more actually. And with the current pro, pro, prototype, we actually just make, we try and do a large clinical trial so that we can be, it can get into the commercialization, commercialization stage and it could be available for the, for the masses out there. So we are really grateful to, to CHPC and to DSI and um, 
uh, also main text. Those are the three bodies which I'd like to acknowledge. And thank you to everybody for listening to the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikiwi, for the interesting talk. So um, we are open to questions. While I'm waiting, maybe I can pose one of my own. So um, I see you use DMOL for one of your things or some of the simulations. What level of theory and basis set did you make use of? Because I didn't see that. Oh yeah, I, I did include the basis sets in, in, in this, but like on the papers, the actual publications, I have the basis set over there. Like for, I use Demol and Gaussian interchangeably. So mostly Demol, I'll probably be screening the whole material, but when I'm like, I, I, then I will take it to Gaussian because it's bigger system. So I want to use onion calculations where I can separate, I can treat the two at different levels of theory. So I've used mostly hybrid uh, functions. Yeah, I was just gonna ask. So now, on, on the follow-up, the QMMM part, are there appropriate parameters for that? What is the gold that you have? Come again. So for the QMMM, when you're treating the MM region, is that only organic, or do you have the metal in there also in the MM region? For my the gold, the gold and the silver are the ones which I treat at at, at MM. Are Why there like parameters the for it? Are the parameters? Yeah, because I'm remember, MM is force fields, right? Yes, yes, yes. So, so you so just need to question? make sure there's appropriate for, uh, parameters for the MM region, because with metals, it often happens that the force fields are not appropriate. So, one has to just be careful. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you for that. We'll look into that. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions, so I'm guessing. From my side, I don't have anything else. Uh, we will then pause this and start the next one at what, 3.45. So guys, there's going to be a bit of a pause till we start the next lecture. Afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second uh, of our talks for the HPC applications. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Courtney van Sutten. Uh, Professor van Sutten is from the School of Physical and Chemical Sciences at Northwest University, Portugal on campus. Uh, she's the lead scientist of the Laboratory for Applied Molecular Modeling and the group leader of the Applied Molecular Modeling Research Group within the research focus area, Chemical Resource Beneficiation at Northwest University. Um, Prof. Sutter is going to be telling us a bit more about what she does in her group today. And over to you, Prof. Thank you, Krishna. I'm just waiting for my slides to share. Can you see my slides? Just a second, I think it's coming up. Yes, you just need to go to slideshow, but it looks good on my end. Okay. Okay, um, thank you for the kind introduction, uh, Krishna. Um, before I start with my presentation, uh, perhaps I must just uh, say thank you, first of all, to CHPC for inviting me to give this presentation. And then secondly, um, but least of all for Krishna. I think um, when Krishna gets to the office in the morning and he sees an email from me, then um, he starts crying and then he go and have three coffees before he opens the email. Uh, but Krishna, thank you for always reacting and helping us as fast as possible and sometimes even at inconvenient times. 
So before I start with um, the computational chemistry that we are doing within the Laboratory of Applied Molecular Modeling, I would just first like to tell you about the Laboratory of Applied Molecular Modeling. So this laboratory is a support laboratory um, for um, computational work, so um, applied molecular modeling. And in this uh, laboratory, we give training, uh, either formal or informal. The formal is more an honors course that we do. We also um, taught this course outside of the university. And we also helped some universities to start their own honors course, like Pretoria and uh, UKZN in Pietermaritzburg. The informal training is more when somebody approaches us and want to do computational work, but um, they don't have any training or they don't have any knowledge about computational work. So then we sit down with them and uh, we give some training and um, help them with the software to be able to start. Then um, the software that we use, uh, we identify a software for a specific problem and then we do the installation for uh, the users and then we look at um, using the software and sometimes uh, we run into problems, sometimes more than we want to and then we try to solve these problems and if we can't, uh, Krishna helps us. And then um, we also help um, uh, researchers to register and have access to the CHPC or to uh, the university's HPC. Then um, every six months we need to do reporting to the CHPC and we do this for the whole group. So we're taking away some of the administration of the researchers within this group and then um, perhaps one of the most important things that we do is we guide um, new researchers or uh, postgraduate students in developing methods for the calculations that they want to do. So they come to us and they tell us this is the problem that we have and how should we approach this and then we identify software, uh, we identify approach and we get them on their way. Now within the Laboratory of Applied Molecular Modeling, we do modeling within the Applied Molecular Modeling Research Group, which I'm going to um, discuss in a moment. And um, we also do some modeling outside of um, the CRB, the Chemical Resource Beneficiation Focus Area, where we help people in physics or in biochemistry, um, in pharmacy, and even in chemical engineering um, to do some of the modeling. And sometimes we get involved into these projects as well. Um, the people that um, the LAM uh, that makes the lamb is our team members and our principal collaborators. Now, um, the team members at this stage is myself and then, of course, um, just a moment, as of course myself and then Kyle Meerholz. Kyle uh, is at the moment still doing his PhD within the group, but he's been appointed as a staff member and indicated that he would like to stay within the group after he's finished his PhD. So he's already started helping within the group. Then we have uh, various collaborators, uh, Prof Professor Rian Leit, uh, formerly of um, Free State University, then of Qatar University and now retired, but very active. Um, uh, experimental person in polymer science and uh, we're working close together. We have two students um, working with us and um, Tyson submitted his PhD yesterday. Then there's uh, Professor Marley Landman and we have a student Nick De Beer um, working in her group. Then Anzal Falsch, um, she's co-supervisor for Kyle, Cherise and Caroline. Uh, Dr. Um, Rihanna Ines, um, Malchas Ines, and she is a co-supervisor for Monique and Anneri. And then I've got two students that um, there is no co-supervisor at the moment. Tiens, um, Tiens and Kyle will be giving prese uh, presentations later in this conference. And then we've got uh, one international student, um, Tashome. Tashome is from Ethiopia. He's a staff member and now doing some research using computational work. Then um, Mariki Ungerer, um, she's involved with uh, Fatima's uh, project. And then we've got one student working on a Johnson and Matthew project where we, uh, Dr. Jane Mongo and um, Dr. Dave Willock is involved in this specific project. 
We also have um, a few international collaborators. Some of them I've already introduced to you. Two that I haven't introduced is um, uh, Professor Nora De Liu and Dr. Um, Feng Zheng. Uh, Professor De Liu is from Leeds University and um, uh, Dr. Zheng is um, from Sindong University in China. Now, um, the people using the CHPC could be divided into staff members, some collaborators and so forth. But if you look at this, um, our pro uh, program was approved at the CHPC in 2016, so we're running for about six years now. And in this time, the main users of the CHPC were our PhD students. Um, just note that the first um, uh, reporting period was 27 months. And this means that we didn't have nine students at a time. It was students coming and going as well. However, the last one here is eight students that's now part of um, this program. Then uh, we are using different HPC um, facilities. Um, when we started uh, before 2016, that was since uh, 2004. In that time, that 12 years, we were mainly only using the Northwest University HPC. Um, origi originally, we were very excited. We had a four CPU um, uh, computer that we could use, and then it grew to 12 CPUs, and we got very excited because we could do transition state. And then in 2016, uh, we started using the CHPC. Um, we started moving away from only doing homogeneous small molecule calculations and moving towards surface um, reactions and material uh, designs. Then in 2017, um, the use of our own HPC decreased dramatically um, due to various reasons and our use of the CHPC increased dramatically. Then in 2018, 2019, we had a, a, a joint project with um, Professor De Liu um, from Cardiff at that stage, where we had students exchanged, uh, exchanging between the two universities, PhD students within the Newton um, NRF um, support or grant. And some of the students, some of my students visited Professor De Liu, and um, at that stage, they were able to use a Hawk and Archer um, uh, through uh, Cardiff University. 2020, we were only relying on the CHPC, and then in 2021, uh, once again, the student working on the Johnson & Matthew project have access to Hawk and Archer um, via Cardiff University. Also, we started using our own HPC again. It's been upgraded, and um, it seems that uh, this is a, a potential a place to do our trial runs or our training or so forth so that we don't misuse the CHPC facility. Now looking at the CPU hours that we used, once again remember the first um, bar graph here, the first bar is for uh, 27 months so um, and the second one is for seven months and then it's six months. So um, to make it more comparable, I've changed it to CPU hours per month. And you'll see we didn't use a lot in the first um, 27 months uh, because we were still finding our feed, our research was changing from only looking at homogeneous catalysis, small molecules and so forth. So we were still learning at that stage. Then in 2018, um, uh, there was some um, acceleration in the in the number of calculations, etc., and in 2019 even more. Then we started uh, looking at the calculations that's being loaded, and we made it more um, effective. So looking at uh, more detail, not just loading calculations, and it decre decreased in 2019-2020. Uh, You'll see that the first two over here, 2018-2019 is in the beginning of the year. And then the next one is for the second half of the year. So this is the first six months, and that's the second six months. And remember, oh, um, at the end of uh, November, many students finish with their studies. So a lot of students leave. That leads to a decrease in the number of CPUs we use. And of course, it's Christmas time, so some people doesn't work over that time, and it decreased. 
Then in 2020, we had the big COVID situation. And um, at that stage, we had a problem with access to the computers to log into the CHPC. Um, and um, after um, many trials and errors, uh, we sorted that out. So in the second part of 2020-21, uh, this was sorted and we were starting to reach again um, the a number of CPU hours leading to uh, the number of uh, increasing the publications and so forth and students finishing. You'll see that for this period, although it was the end of the year to the beginning of the year, it looks better than in 2019, 2020. And that's because students were trying to catch up for the time that they had problems with access. Now, the last bar on this graph um, is misleading. It looks as if we drastically increased using CPU hours. But in this period, um, as you all know, we had a little bit of problems with teeth teething of moving from the old luster to the new luster back to the old luster. And we had load shedding, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot of the calculations failed. And that means many of the calculations had to be repeated using uh, CPU hours that um, wouldn't have been used if we had um, a, a smooth running at that stage. Then the software that we are using, um, you'll see that the main software that we are using within the Laboratory of Applied Molecular Modeling and in the research group is Material Studios. We're using a little bit of VASP and um, Gaussian. And this year we started using VASP via Medea. Um, and this is also running then on the HPC um, at Northwest University. But our main software that we are using is Material Studios. The modules within Material Studios that we are using, uh, originally we were only using DMOL 3 because that's what our um, hardware uh, could, could be used on our hardware. And then when we started using um, the CHPC, we started using CASTEP. And you'll see that our use of CASTEP increased over the time because our focus in our research also changed from homogeneous to heterogeneous. You'll see there's a little bit of use of foresight and amorphous cell. This, this is mainly for the people working in the polymers. So they will build the polymers in amorphous cell and use foresight to optimize that. There's also a little bit of use of D, uh, DPD. Um, the last three here, the uh, foresight, amorphous cell, and DPD is also used by Dr. Otu. That's within our um, uh, research um, uh, laboratory, within the laboratory, um, because he's working on drug discovery. And he's also using then these modules to look at things like uh, permeability of membranes and so forth. The publications in 2016, we only had three from out of um, the laboratory. And then in 2017, we had 12. We had a very eager PhD student. And then 2018, 2019, 2020, we averaged about seven publications a year. Now 2021 is not finished yet. Uh, there's a few submitted and hopefully uh, some of them will be accepted and we'll reach our target of at least seven publications. Now we get to the applied molecular modeling. Within the applied molecular modeling, we're looking mainly at computational catalysis. That's our focus. That's what we are interested in. And this catalysis uh, could be divided into the homogeneous catalysis and the heterogeneous catalysis. And our main focus of heterogeneous catalysis is electrocatalysis. We have done a little bit of photocatalysis, and we are going to do some more of that. But at the moment, our main focus is electrocatalysis. So heterogeneous catalysis, electrocatalysis. But to be able to do the heterogeneous catalysis, we need good catalysts. And the good catalysts is where we have materials and and we're using uh, metals. Um, we're looking at uh, bimetals and uh, tenery metals, and now we're moving towards nanoparticles. If we look at these materials, we're looking at structural properties, we're looking at electronic properties, and we're looking at reactions on the surfaces that's involved in these, this electrocatalysis. As soon as we clarify the mechanism, then we can look at the energy profile to decide which mechanism is the most favorable for the specific reaction we're looking at. 
Now, within our group, we try to look at taking some products of pollution and then converting it to alternative or renewable energy, uh, mainly looking at uh, the production of um, hydrogen as the energy source. And the catalyst that's mostly used is your platinum catalyst, your heterogeneous platinum catalyst. But platinum has got its own problems. It's rare, it's expensive, um, it gets poisoned by sulfur, and it also goes into solution if we're working in an acidic uh, environment. So if we look at the HICE process, we're focusing on this part of the reaction. So we're taking SO2 and water and we're trying to produce the hydrogen over here. So I'll get later back to the water and the SO2 on the surface. Now, before we can change the catalyst, we need to understand the one that's being used at the moment. Now, I've only put in one slide here, but um, Mariki Ungerer, Dr. Mariki Ungerer, um, in her postdoc with me and uh, Professor De Liu, um, looked at um, coverage of, of the uh, uh, platinum surfaces, different ones, the 001, the triple one, the 011. Um, so she looked at uh, covering the surface with water, um, covering the surface with SO2, covering the surface with only sulfur, SO3, etc. So a whole range of sulfur containing um, uh, molecules. And the work on the sulfur has been published um, earlier this year. Now, after um, covering the surfaces, uh, we created um, phase diagrams. And from this, we can see that if we're working at high temperatures, then the coverage is quite low. So the coverage is decreasing as the temperature is increasing. Um, if we're working at a low temperature, we see that if the pressure increases, the coverage increases. And uh, then we can go and determine what the coverage will be of the different species if we're working in the highest process at the pressure and the temperature for that specific reaction. Action. Um, the next thing we need to look at is the um, reaction on it uh, on the surface and Tians is doing this work so he took the platinum surface and we're only focusing on the 111 surface and adding uh, the co-absorption so uh, Mariki looked at only adding water and seeing how much is needed to cover the surface SO2 how much is needed to cover the surface and Tians is now looking at if we co-absorb how does a molecule already on the surface influence the absorption of the second molecule and which pathway will be the more favorable one. Uh, he has a poster in the conference, so please do go and look at his work. Then um, we started looking at bimetals. And in the bimetals, the first one we looked at is replacing some of the platinum atoms in our uh, catalyst with nickel. And Louise did this for her um, uh, PhD. Um, she finished end of last year and uh, she used SOD on the CHPC to create different combinations of nickel platinum, optimizing them and then go and look at which um, ratio of platinum to nickel is the most favorable uh, energy wise. Then we took the, um, uh, it was the one to one ratio that was the most favorable. Then we took the one-to-one -one ratio, we looked at different um, uh, uh, configurations of that, and we looked at cutting the surface at different depths within the metal. After we've done that, we determined the charge distribution on the surfaces, and then looked at where the water molecule will coordinate on the surface and how the neighboring and the next layer of atoms will influence the coordination of these water molecules on the surface. Um, this publication will be submitted within the next week. Then the next metal we looked at um, was palladium. So Carl was looking at the palladium. Um, uh, once again, a ratio uh, mixing the platinum with palladium. In other words, substitute, substituting some of the platinum atoms with palladium. He used SOD to do this again. And um, out of Dr. Ansel Falsch's um, theoretical work for her PhD, it ha has been shown that a platinum-3 palladium-2 or a platinum-2 palladium-3 is the ones that's the most active in the electrocatalysis. And um, Carl then identified which of the configurations of this specific um, bimetals um, will be the most stable. 
Now he's finishing up. Uh, you'll see when you go and look at his micro talk, um, he investigated something else with this metal, um, uh, bimetal. Um, using this bimetal, Fatima will now, for her PhD, um, look at cutting surfaces like Louise did with the nickel um, platinum, looking at um, uh, ab absorption on the surface of water and SO2, and looking at the reactions that um, Tians will give us the mechanism, um, hopefully before she needs to do it. And then she, the next step will be to substitute some of the platinum or palladium with a third metal um, and seeing how that metal will influence the activity of these catalysts. Uh, this work has been published um, earlier this year. Then we decided let's go and look at something that doesn't have platinum in it and we decided that rainy nickel is an option now rainy nickel has been used for um, the water electrolysis um, the al alkaline water electrolysis and um, the the porosity of your rainy nickel is influenced by your precursor of your rainy nickel and your precursor is a nickel aluminium bimetal so to develop a model to look at the rainy nickel as the catalyst, we first needed to develop a bimetal um, a system. And um, Cherise, for her masters, um, used SOD again and developed um, various ratios using uh, entropy. She um, identified the, uh, this eight ratios with the specific configurations as the best options to look at. And now the next step will be to optimize these structures to cut surfaces and then look at the leaching of the aluminium from these surfaces, which is the second part of her masters. Um, this part, um, creating the biometals, um, the manuscript has been accepted. We're waiting for it to be published. And then Caroline is our honor student. Um, she started looking at the leaching of the one to one ratio of this specific uh, biometal. Um, so that we have the, the preliminary study for Cherise to do it for all the different configurations. Then our future work, which we already started with, is looking at nanoparticles and defects in surfaces. Because no, none of these catalysts is perfect, and we know that nanoparticles is something that is being used very much these days, and it has a lot of potential. So um, our nanoparticles, um, we've got Monique, a master student working on nickel nanoparticles um, or nanoparticles with nickel and another metal. And we've got um, Anari working on a gold copper um, bimetallic nanoparticles. Um, we are going to substitute some of the atoms in different places on this specific nanoparticle in planes or on the vertex on the edge and see how it influences the reactivity of these nanoparticles and then as soon as Tiens is finished with um, investigating the mechanism on the uh, uh, perfect platinum surface uh, we're going to um, introduce some defects into the surface and see how the mechanism will change And with that, I would just like to acknowledge um, the CHPC. Without their facilities, we wouldn't have made the progress we have made in the last six years. And hopefully, um, we will be allowed to use their facilities for another um, six plus years, even longer, if possible. Um, and also, uh, once again, for Krishna for helping us um, as our representative at uh, CHPC or our support person at CHPC. Then, of course, the Northwest University and the Chemical Resource Beneficiation uh, Research Focus Area for giving us the time and uh, resources to be able to do the research. And last but not least, thank you for your attention and thank you for the opportunity to present some of the work that's very close to my heart to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Connie, for the talk. Um, we have a few minutes, so while we're waiting for some questions from the people, just from my side, on behalf of CHPC, we would like to apologize for the issues that you did experience. We know that it, it was frustrating for a lot of people, but we hope that things are running fine now again and you're able to use the system like you're supposed to. Yeah. Krishna, um, something that don't kill you, make you stronger. I think we grew stronger in this year. 
I'm glad to hear that. Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions. Um, I don't know if anyone has any. Just give it like another second or so. But otherwise, from my side, I would like to thank you for the talk. And thank you for being a good user of CHPC and a loyal user of CHPC. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And um, please keep us in mind. Don't throw us off the C CHPC if bigger uh, projects come along. Because we're not using uh, as many uh, CPU hours as some of the other people. In comparison, hours are quite small, but we cannot do what we're doing if we don't have the resources that you um, uh, supply to us. Now, so the plus is we are looking for a new system soon and it will only be better, right? So it will at least give you better CPU power as well. So you'll That's definitely wonderful still news. <laughs> That's wonderful news. Okay. Thank you, Kwani, uh, and thank you, everybody, for attending the session. I think that's bringing the session to a close. Thank you, Krishna. Have a lovely day. You too.